We're going to be reading uh, all of chapter Exodus, or all of chapter 14 of Exodus this morning, verses 1 through 31. So follow along with me as we read this unbelievable story of what the Lord does for his people. Exodus chapter 14, starting with verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of Pi Haharoth, between Migdal and the sea, in front of Baal Zephon. You shall encamp facing it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the people of Israel, they are wandering in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed toward the people. And they said, what is this we have done so that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his army with him and took 600 chosen chariots and all other chariots that, uh, of Egypt with officers over all of them. And the Lord hardened his heart, hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. The Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them encamped by the sea by pi in front of baal Zephon. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you and you have only to be silent. The Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove back the sea by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided." And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them in the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning, watch the Lord in the pillar of fire and of cloud, looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into a midst, into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen of all the hosts of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians so that the people feared the Lord and they believed in the Lord and in his servant, Moses. Let's pray. God, what an amazing story we have before us here in Exodus 14. What a beautiful thing it is to see the way that you bring your people to a place where only you can save them. And then you show them your glory. You show them your power by salvation. 
And you rescue them, and you provide a way when there is no other way. You make a path to life. You make a path into life with you uh, that we couldn't see before, that didn't exist before, that you simply made it out of grace and out of kindness for us. And Lord, we also thank you that you save through judgment. We thank you that the enemy has been thrown to the bottom of the sea. We thank you that evil and sin and death and brokenness will all be gone one day when you return and when you triumph over it once and for all, Lord, we long for that day. And as we study your word this morning, as we study Exodus 14, as we think about the salvation that you have provided, Lord, I pray that our hearts might be uh, captivated by the reality that you alone can save. Lord, help us to respond to your salvation just like the people of Israel did with fear and belief. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, uh, it's good to be back in the pulpit. I've been here. Uh, I don't know if you guys noticed that. I was here, actually, when Craig was preaching, and it was so nice to just sit and listen to someone else preach. And uh, it was wonderful, and Craig did such a great job. I think it was the first time in over a year that I've, that I've had two weeks in a row where I've not been preaching. And so I was so grateful for Craig and so grateful not only that he was willing to do it, but that he's willing and able to teach the Bible to our church. Um, and I'm super, super grateful for that. So I don't think Craig's in here, but uh, somebody tell Craig later that I told him he did a great job and that I'm thankful for him. I guess I could tell him later. Anyways, uh, what Craig did the last few weeks, he walked us through chapter 13 in the story of Exodus, the story where the people have walked out of Egypt as free, rescued people, and the Lord is guiding them by the pillar of fire and cloud. And we pick up the story this morning right here in chapter 14, where you find one of the most well-known, famous uh, Bible passages, stories of Scripture in all of Scripture, right? If you ask the common person, hey, tell me all the Bible verses you know, this is probably one of the ones that they're going to be able to uh, talk to you about. This story of God's parting the sea, saving Israel, and destroying the Egyptian army. It's a famous story. It's a well-known story because it's an amazing story, isn't it? It's an unbelievable story. It's a miraculous story. It's a story that boggles the mind when we see the Lord unleashing power again and again and again. And this time he does it for the final salvation of Israel. So far, the whole story of Exodus has been God making promises and keeping promises. God delivering upon the promises that he has made to his people. Up until this point, he has provided them freedom, right? They're free. They're out of Egypt. They've been uh, let go by Pharaoh. And he's also provided an increasingly convincing but not yet permanent victory over Egypt. Okay, Egypt's been decimated. He's decimated the people of Egypt, the the armed forces of Egypt, uh, the gods of Egypt. He's kind of, he's been judging, he's been destroying, but they're still there. They have not yet been completely destroyed. Israel is not yet completely free from Egypt as a threat. And it's in this chapter, it's in this story that God, with complete finality, destroys Egypt, destroys Pharaoh. And after this chapter, Israel is not under any threat from Egypt anymore, not under any threat from Pharaoh anymore. God saves them. And you know what they do? They watch. They just watch as the Lord saves them. And as they do that, they believe in the Lord. So here's our main idea this morning from this text. Beholding, seeing the salvation of God cultivates belief in the God of salvation. That's what's happening in this chapter. The God of salvation is saving his people. And as the people, you see this word the see, see, saw, saw over and over and over again. All that Israel did to participate in, in their salvation experience here in this chapter is watch the Lord save. They don't fight. They don't do anything. All they do is watch the Lord save. That's what's absolutely amazing about this chapter. Like we've seen all throughout the book of Exodus, everything that has happened for Israel has happened by the hands of God. They haven't done anything. They've done literally nothing to secure their own freedom or salvation. And this chapter is like the pinnacle of that truth in Exodus. It's like the ultimate picture of these people did not save themselves. God did. It's entirely an act of the Lord. It's entirely something that God must do 
for people. And as we see that, like they are here, as we watch it happen, as it unfolds before our very eyes and we behold it, belief and trust in this God who saves is going to be cultivated and instilled within us. And that's going to change us. It's going to change the type of people we are. It's going to change the type of lives that we live. And so this is it, this story, this is it. This is where God finishes it. God has started the work of salvation, and now he is going to finish it. The rest of the story of Exodus, I hate to break it to you, spoilers, the rest of the story of Exodus is basically just God showing the people how to live now as free people. He gives them the law, and he gives them the tabernacle, and he tells them what to do. He tells them, now that you are free, saved people, here's how you're to live. That's what the rest of Exodus, for the most part, is. This is the final salvation. This is when the Lord has completely set them free. This is the final showdown between God and the superpower of the world. It's the final showdown between God and Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world. It's the final showdown between the one true God and all the powerless, fake, false gods of Egypt. He has started the work of salvation. Everything leading up until this moment has been God starting the work of salvation. And today is the day he finishes it. And so here's what's happened really quickly. I'm summarizing the last couple chapters here. The people put their faith in the blood of the lamb for salvation. They put their faith in the blood of the lamb to be spared. They plunder Egypt. They ask for all of Egypt's stuff. Egypt gives them all their stuff. They leave with all Egypt's stuff. They start heading east toward the promised land, just like God told them to. And they've got this pillar of fire and cloud guiding them. And they're feeling pretty good, right? Like we're free. We're out. Egypt in the past. Pharaoh in the past. And now we've got this mighty visual force of God leading us and telling us where to go. And then this happens. In one through four. Read with me in uh, 14, one through four. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of Pi Haharahath between Migdal and the sea in front of Baal Zephon. You shall encamp facing it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the people of Israel, they are wandering in the land. The wilderness has shut them in and I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. And so they're on their way out, man. They're, they're feeling good. They're feeling free. They're feeling like light and happy, no doubt, as free people. And then God says, hey, real quick, go back. Turn around. Go back the other way toward Egypt and make camp between an enemy stronghold and an impassable body of water. And they do it. God bless them. They do it, right? They actually go. All the people go. And up until this point, you don't hear any complaining. And so what it seems like, it seems like God's leading them into a trap, doesn't it? It seems like God is bringing them unnecessarily between a rock and a hard place with no way out. And then God tells Moses basically, yeah, it is a trap, but not for you guys. This is a trap for Pharaoh. It's a trap for his army because when he sees what looks like you guys wandering around aimlessly in the wilderness, when he sees what looks like you guys in like the most vulnerable place in the world, he's going to come after you. I'm going to harden his heart. He's going to come after you. And when he does, God tells Moses, I'm going to get glory over them. And they shall know that I am the Lord. And so God, while the people are, remember, God had been leading them that way. And now God is leading them back the other way. And he's brought Israel to this place between an enemy stronghold and the sea in order to bring Pharaoh to this place. In order to show both Pharaoh and everybody there and countless generations throughout history since then who read this story, the unbelievable, overwhelming power to save that only he possesses and the worthiness of all glory that only he possesses. And so this is the next point in your notes. God saves in order to first reveal his character. He says that they shall know that I am the Lord. This is, we've seen this phrase over and over and over again, God, right? God wants Egypt. He wants Israel. He wants us. He wants everybody to know who he is and to know that he is the Lord, that he is God almighty, that only he can save. He wants them to to see his character. So God saves in order to reveal his character, that they shall know that I'm the Lord and receive his glory. He says, I will get glory. 
And so there's purpose here in what God is doing. There's a lot of purpose here as we're going to uncover this morning. There's great purpose. This whole salvation event, everything that is happening, everything that God is orchestrating right here and bringing the people back and then everything that's about to happen, it has purpose. That, that these people in this moment, that Israel, that Egypt, that everybody who sees and hears throughout all the generations what this God has done on this day so many years ago, to see his name, his identity, and his character, to begin to understand who is this God. That's part of the reason he's doing this, that they may know that I am the Lord. Part of the reason that God did this thousands of years ago was so that you, as we are here talking about this thousands of years later, might know that he alone is the Lord. And as that happens, as he rescues, as he saves, as his character and his identity and his holiness become known and become evident to all who are watching, he gets glory. He gets honor. He gets praise. He gets fame for the salvation that he has provided. And so God is leading Israel into a corner where he can show them that it is only him who can save them. And it is only him who is worthy of glory. He's brought them to a place. And this is a tough thing sometimes. I think God does this in our lives. He's brought them to a place where uh, their only shot at seeing salvation is if he saves them. He's bringing them to a place where they can recognize, I think rightfully so, that only he can save. And so I think God does this sometimes in grace. He does this sometimes out of his kindness. He brings us into corners. He brings us between a rock and a hard place. He brings us to a place of vulnerability in order to teach us and show us an eternal, like a huge truth and reality that only he can save us. He might bring you to a really hard place. He might bring you to a place of brokenness. He might bring you to the bottom of a pit. He might bring you to between the sea and the army of Pharaoh just to show you that only he can save you. And that's what he's doing here. And then this happens in verses 5 through 9. Shocker, what God says is going to happen, happens. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed toward the people. And they said, what is this we have done that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his army with him and took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel while the people were, uh, were going out defiantly. The Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army, and they overtook them encamped by the sea by Pihaharahath in front of Baal Zephon. So just like God says, Pharaoh regrets it. He looks at these people wandering aimlessly, and he goes, what have we done? It's amazing how quickly he forgets, isn't it? It's amazing how quickly we forget. And so all the king's horses and all the king's men and all the king's chariots come after them. This is what, God, this is what the enemy does. When, when he loses territory, when he loses ground, when you start walking out of his reign and out of his domain of darkness and toward freedom, toward life with the Lord, he does not cede that territory without a fight. He will not let you go without a fight. And if you have walked with the Lord for longer than a day or two, you know that this is true. He keeps coming after you and he's going to keep coming after you. This is what he does. And I think that often, if not always in the Christian life, especially if you're a new believer, he's going to come extra hard after you. He's going to try and reclaim the territory in your heart. He's going to try and take you back into the domain of darkness. It says they overtook them by the sea and surrounded them. And so again, if you're Israel, things are not looking too good right now, Right? You were, you were like free and feeling good and marching toward freedom not that long ago. And now all of a sudden you're stuck between the enemy and the sea. And even though there were a lot of Israelites, like we saw a couple weeks ago, they had no army, they had no weapons, they had no generals, they had their wives and their kids and their animals and all their stuff with them. This was a slaughter waiting to happen. This was an absolute slaughter waiting to happen. And whoever, uh, in this day and age, whoever had more chariots, usually won. Chariots were like the tanks of the day. If you had more, you win. You know how many Israel has? Zero. You know how many Pharaoh has? At least 600, right? A lot. He's got a lot of chariots. This is, this is a, a slaughter waiting to happen. 
And so again, this is kind of crazy if you think about it. This is Israel listening to the Lord. God bless them. Going where the Lord leads. God bless them, right? Like following where God tells them to go. And not that long earlier, they were free and celebrating and feeling pretty good. And now they find themselves facing what is certain death. That's quite a turn. That's quite a turn that you really don't want to make, right? As a free person, being turned back from freedom back to a place of certain death. What God is about to save them from is just that. It's the next point in your notes. God saves us from certain death. Hate to be the bearer of bad news this morning, but we are in the same predicament. You're in the same predicament. We're not immortal people. You're going to die. I'm going to die. We're all going to die someday. We don't like to think about it, do we? We sure do not like to think about it. And we don't like to talk about it. And we don't like to talk to our kids about it. We're probably going to have to put our, put our dog down this week, which is not ever easy. And we've been kind of debating about how do we talk to Ezra about this. You know, and we kind of landed at people die. Dogs die. Everyone dies. We don't like to talk about it. We don't like to talk to our kids about it. We fill our lives with busyness so that we don't have to think about it. We fill our homes with stuff so we don't have to think about it. We fill our lives with comfort so that we don't have to think about it. We're trying to make ourselves forget that there is this one end awaiting all of us that we're going to die. You're going to die. Seriously. That day is coming for every single one of us. I listened to a podcast recently that there's a guy on it talking about how churches not having cemeteries on their property anymore has sort of shielded us from the constant daily, weekly reminder that we all end up six feet under. It's where every single one of us is headed. We're insulated from the realities of death. There's no avoiding it. Do you know that? You can't avoid it. And there's no point. There's no use in trying to numb yourself to it either. That doesn't do you any good. And so we all need to realize and remember, I know you know this, but we all need to think about often that all that our future holds, the only thing that is certain about our future is that we're going to die. Certain death. And not only are we all going to die one day, but because of our sin and our rebellion against God, we're going to experience something even worse. We're going to experience eternal death in the fires of hell. We're not basically good people. Did you know that? You're not. Maybe you think you are. You're not. Maybe you're a smart person and you know you're not. You're not basically a good person who's got a shot at earning your way into righteousness and and your way into heaven. Your heart, your life is polluted with sin. And the only thing that you deserve is death. It's the wages of sin, Paul says in Romans. It's the only outcome for sinners, which all of us are. What every single one of us in this room faces is certain earthly death and certain eternal death. That is the reality for every single one of us. That is the culmination of every human life. Death and death eternal. Apart from the salvation of the Lord. God saves us from that. He saves us from certain death. Without God's salvation, certain death will be your end. It will be all of our ends. And the more you think about that, the more you sit in that, the older you get, the more gray hairs start coming in right here on your beard. The more you contemplate death, it's going to drive you into a place of fear. It's going to drive you into a place of despair. And you know what? It should. It should drive you into a place of hopelessness. It should drive you to a place of despair where you're asking yourself, what what hope is there? Just like it did for Israel. Read with me verses 10 through 12. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them and they feared greatly. 
And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, listen to this. Again, this is people who were marching free and feeling good not that long ago. Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What are they seeing before them? They're seeing Pharaoh's army marching after them. They see Pharaoh's army marching after them, equating to certain death. They're saying, we're going to die here. Why did you bring us through all of this to just die here? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? (laughs) What have you done? Why did you set us free? Why did you bring us out of slavery? Why did you rescue us just to end up here to die? Is this not what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. Is that what they were saying? No, those crazy people, they wanted out. They were crying out to the Lord for freedom. And now they're looking back. They're looking at this prospect of certain death and they're saying, I'd rather be back there. And we do the same thing, right? Anything but death. Anything but having to talk about death. Anything but having to think about death. They're overwhelmed with fear and despair. But here's the thing. They're only despairing because they forgot who their God was. They forgot who had just rescued them. They forgot what he had just done. They forgot what he was capable of. And they forgot what he had promised to them. That he would bring them to the promised land. They forgot who their God was. They lost sight of the God of their salvation. They had already lost faith in him. And as faith in the Lord decreases, fear of the enemy Despair of death increases, and they begin drowning in sorrow and fear and hopelessness. So if you're the Israelites here on the shore, facing certain death, terrified, here's what a faith response would have been. Faith would say, I do not see a way forward, but God has made promises that I know he will keep. And I trust him to keep those promises. That's what faith would say. Is that what they're saying? No. They're despairing. Despair would say exactly what they said. And part of what's so incredible about the salvation of God is that it is exactly that type of despair that God saves us from too in this life. This is the next point in your notes. God not only saves us from certain death, he saves us from the despair of certain death. Can you imagine if the world without Christ was thinking about death as often as it should? What kind of, what kind of atmosphere that would create in a, in a workplace or in a home or in a, anywhere? As we're all constantly thinking, it's going to take them to this place. This is something that God rescues his people from. He not only rescues us from actually facing that certain death, he rescues us from having to despair over certain death. This is a beautiful thing. When you see someone who is on their deathbed or you see someone who is approaching death, you see someone whose health is just constantly, constantly declining and they have such hope and such joy to the point they're actually looking forward to death. They're looking forward to what lies after that. They're looking forward to what God is going to do because they have faith in this God. And they believe that when he makes a promise that he's going to bring them into his presence for all of eternity, that he's going to keep that promise. And so faith would have said, uh, this is, this is, I have no idea what God's going to do here. I can't imagine a way forward. I don't know what I can do. I've got no power here, but I know that God's going to do something because he made promises and he's going to keep them. And God has rescued us from that crushing weight of knowing that death is unavoidable. This is a real, tangible, mental, emotional, spiritual blessing of God's salvation that we can experience and understand every day in our lives. That believing in the God of salvation means being able to sit right where they're sitting on the beach between certain death and certain death and say, I don't care, God is going to save me. God's got my back. He's going to rescue me. He's going to bring us into his presence. That kind of hope, that kind of confidence, that kind of assurance comes only when we keep our eyes fixed on who the God of salvation is. They didn't, they forgot, and now all they're seeing is the enemy and they're despairing. 
But if you keep your eyes fixed on the God of salvation, he frees us, he saves us from despair. Isn't that a beautiful thing? He's saving us from despairing of death. And Moses seems to be the only one who gets that because here's how he responds. Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. At this point, you know what God's told Moses about how he's going to save them? Nothing. He's only told them that he's going to get glory over them. He's only told them that he's going to save them. And yet Moses, acting and speaking from a place of faith and trust in his God, stands up and tells the people that they need not despair, they need not waver, they need not do a thing. Why? Because the Lord will fight for you. He is going to save you. This is astounding faith from Moses. He's just as cornered just as trapped, probably just as scared as everybody else is. And he says, fear not, stand firm, be silent. God's going to save us. Don't despair, don't run, don't fight, don't speak. Just watch what the Lord is gonna do. Just see the salvation of the Lord. What amazing words of exhortation and encouragement from Moses to frightened, faithless people. Basically, sit down, shut up, and just watch with wonder as the Lord saves. So this is the next point in your notes. God saves by fighting the enemy for us while we watch with wonder. Our words, our actions, our strength, our power, our thoughts, they're not only of no help against Pharaoh's army, they're not only of no help against sin and the enemy and death, they're completely unnecessary. We don't need those things. Salvation is of the Lord. Salvation is something God does completely on his own for us. The only thing that we do to participate in salvation, the Lord's salvation, is watch it unfold with wonder and awe and reverence at this God. And what he's done. Isn't that an amazing thing? Our God fights for us. He battles for us. We don't need to run. We don't need to fight. We don't need to worry. We don't need to fear. All we have to do is watch the Lord do battle with the enemy. Isn't that an amazing thing? Praise God that he has done this for us in Christ Jesus. He sent him a lowly carpenter to do battle with sin, to do battle with the evil one. And he has come through victorious. He battled right after his baptism. He battled in the wilderness alone. He battled in the garden alone. He battled in the courtroom alone. He battled on the cross alone. He battled on Golgotha alone. He went into the tomb alone and he rose from the dead victorious and triumphant. He beat it for us. He overcame, he fought, he conquered, he destroyed the enemy once and for all. Praise God that he has fought for us and we don't need to fear anymore. There's nothing to be afraid of. Praise God. We can look certain death in the face and say, I'm not afraid. Praise God that he has fought for us and all we have to do is stand firm in our trust and just marvel at what he's done. And then I love this verse in verse 15. The Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Stop crying. Get moving. Stop whining. Stop crying out to me. Get a move on. He tells them to start moving toward the sea before he's told them he's going to part it. So again, another action that requires faith. And then God tells Moses in verses 16 through 18, lift up your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. We already talked about this. God saves in order to reveal his character and receive his glory. That's what he's telling them all over again. And he's going to do that by dividing the sea and then by undividing the sea, which will result in the destruction of Pharaoh and his army and the salvation of Israel. God gets glory when he saves and he gets glory when he destroys. 
He always gets glory. Then the angel of God who was going before the host of Israel moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud in the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other. The angel of God, the pillar of cloud that had been guiding them from the front, now guarding them from the rear, coming between Egypt and Israel, shrouding Egypt in darkness and Israel in light. This is what the presence of the Lord is. It is darkness. It is judgment on the enemy. And it is light and freedom for the people of the Lord. One of the commentaries I read this week said what was light for Israel, talking about the presence of the Lord, was darkness for the Egyptians. The presence of the Lord, he was a guiding light for his people, but he was a judging darkness for the enemy. And he stood between them as a powerful protector, an impassable shield, and mighty defender. And so here's the next point in your notes. God saves by standing between us and the enemy. He stood between. And again, this is an amazing picture of what God has done for us, that Jesus stands between us and the enemy. He is our rock, our refuge, our protector, our stronghold, our defender. He's the champion who stepped in front of the enemy and provided salvation for us. Not yet through the permanent destruction of evil, though praise God that day is coming, but by actually taking the judgment upon himself, by experiencing death himself. That's how he stood between. He sat there. He stood there. And then he hung there between death and us. On the cross, Christ stood between you and death, between you and the wages of your sin. He stood between, just like he did in the story of Exodus. And then verses 21 through 29, here's what it says. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove back the sea by a strong east wind all night. And made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, and the waters being a wall on their right and on their left hand, the Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea. All Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen, in the morning watch the Lord in the pillar of fire and cloud, looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. And so Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen of all the host of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea and the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left hand. He drives back the sea. I hate to break it to you people. He didn't slam the staff and then the waters went like in the movies. He held back his hand and the Lord drove the sea by an east wind, which is actually to me an even mightier demonstration of his power and of his sovereignty over all of creation. That the wind is working for the purposes of his people. The Lord is speaking for the purposes of his people. And then Pharaoh's army chases after them. The Lord throws them into a panic. Their chariots fall apart. There's those verses that say the weapons of the enemy will not prosper, right? This is a picture of that against the sovereign God. The waters come crashing down and not one of them remained. God saves Israel through judgment. And we've seen this over and over and over again. Not one of the enemy forces remained. They were completely obliterated. This is the next point. I know it's God saves by completely destroying the enemy. God has rendered our enemy completely powerless. Completely. He's overthrown. He's overpowered the enemy and his forces. 1 Corinthians 15, 26 says the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And there is going to be a day when this will happen with finality. The day promised in Revelation when all sin, all evil, all death, all weeping, all mourning will be completely done away with. When the Son of Man will put all things under subjection under his feet. That day is coming. And that is a day that we ought to long for as God's people. The day when our salvation will be fully and completely realized in this world. And the enemy will be completely destroyed. He saves by completely destroying the enemy. There's no, nothing to fear left. There's no enemy left. There's nobody chasing after you anymore. You're free. 
And that day, that kind of freedom is coming. And then we have this concluding summary in verses 30 through 31. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hands of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. What a phrase. The Lord saved Israel that day. And all Israel did was watch as the Lord fought for them. That's all they did. As he stood between them and the enemy. As he provided a way of salvation and then completely destroyed the enemy. And the visualization of their dead oppressors washing up on the seashore was this gruesome but beautiful sign that salvation had been fully accomplished. The death of the enemy is what gave them hope. And for Christians, for us today, the concrete sign that salvation has been fully and completely accomplished for us is not the sight of the dead enemy on the seashore, but the sight of the Son of God dead on a cross. When Christ hung there suffocating and bleeding, remember what he said? It is finished. It's done. There's no more work to be done. There's no more... Work, like works to be done. There's no more pursuing to be done. There's no more fearing to be done. There's no more fighting to be done. All that we have to do is behold Christ on the cross. No more needed to be done. No more could be done. His fighting for us, his work for us is the only thing that could accomplish salvation. And it did. It's done. It's finished. That's what he said. He told us. That's, again, that's a promise of the Lord. It's a statement. It's a declaration. It's done. Battle's won. The enemy's been overthrown. The enemy's been defeated. Christ accomplished the work for us. And the way that we can know that for sure is because he hung there on the cross. And life left his body. And he finished the work. The Israelites saw the dead Egyptians and they saw the great power the Lord used to save them. And they came believers. It said, so the people feared the Lord and they believed in the Lord. In that beautiful phrase, in the same way for us, when we see the Son of God hanging on the cross in our place, when we see the great power that the Lord used against our enemy to secure our salvation, this is the only reasonable, logical response to fear that God and to believe in that God, to honor him, to give him glory, to put your trust in him. He's the only God that is trustworthy. He's the only true God. And so this is the last point in your notes. God saves so that we might see, fear, and believe in him. Again, there's a goal here. There's a goal that we might see him. We might know that he is the Lord, that we might comprehend who he is, that we might honor and give glory to who he is, that we might fear who he is because we see his power. We see the holiness. And that we might believe in him and trust in this God. Christ's saving work on the cross has been lifted up through God's word for all to see. We have all seen the salvation of the Lord and the mighty work he accomplished to secure our freedom. And so the only proper response now for you, if you have not done this, is fear the Lord and believe in him. Put your trust in him, experience salvation by his hands, and then continue to follow him one step at a time into the promised land. Beholding the salvation of God, fixating on the cross and on the gospel of Jesus, you know what it does? I already told you this, it cultivates belief in us. When we look at the cross, when we look at the salvation that the Lord has done, when we see it, when we behold it, Trust in a God like that is cultivated in our hearts. Look at the Son of God on the cross. Keep your eyes fixed there. Behold him on the cross. The word salvation is the Hebrew word Yeshua. So when Moses says, see the salvation of the Lord, he's literally saying, see the Yeshua of the Lord. The name of Jesus is the name Yeshua. 
And so my final exhortation for you this morning is the same as Moses' final exhortation to Israel as they're terrified there of certain death. Fear not, stand firm, be still, and behold Christ. That is where salvation comes from. You don't need to work. You don't need to earn. You don't need to be. You don't need to do. All you have to do is behold Christ on the cross, and you will be saved. Believe in him, and you will be saved. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this amazing chapter. Thank you for giving us this story. Thank you for so powerfully and beautifully helping us see and comprehend your salvation. And Lord, thank you for such a, such a thing as this in, in the Old Testament and for such a thing as this in the New Testament that your people can, can stand at the foot of the cross and keep our eyes fixed there and just behold salvation and see that if we believe and if we trust in what you have accomplished for us on the cross, we too will be free. We too will be saved. We too can walk into new life with you both on this, and on this earth and in eternity. But thank you for saving us. Thank you for being a mighty God. Thank you. Even though I probably don't say thank you when I'm in those corners, thank you for bringing us to the corners that remind us that you alone are sovereign, that you alone have power to save, that you alone have saved. Lord, help each person in this room to, to believe and to re-believe and re-believe and re-believe over and over and over again in the work of Christ, in the salvation that you have accomplished for us. Help us to behold it so that we might come to a place of belief and trust in you. And Lord, as we're about to partake of the Lord's Supper, I pray that you would just fill our hearts to, with, with gratitude and with understanding for what you have accomplished for us, with what your death on the cross actually means, with how you accomplished our salvation for us. So Lord, we're so grateful, and we're so grateful for this meal that we get to take together as your people, as a remembrance and as a proclamation at the same time. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'm going to give you just a couple of minutes uh, to...